panel session on a trauma case review. I will introduce the panelists, Dr. Maines, Dr. Lechuga, who spoke earlier, Kathleen Mayer, Program Director for Flight for Life Colorado, Dr. Natalie Ayers, who did a presentation on airway management, and Scott Phillips, the Group Director for Pre-Hospital Services. And remember to use the Q&A box for your questions. Dr. Maines? All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Welcome, Welcome back. back. Uh, audio, audio okay here? here? All right. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? All right. Sounds like it. So we're going to do a, a case presentation. We're going to have, we're going to present the case. We're going to do some polling questions and then give a little bit of the literature to support the answers to that. These questions in the polling questions are intentionally vague. You get in difficult situations, just like in some of our other situ uh, our presentations earlier, you get into these situations, there is no clear right answer. So we have a whole bunch of multiple choice questions, but some of those questions may not any one of them be the right answer or some combination thereof. So let's just uh, go ahead and jump in. So this is a... Uh, The, the location for this is a rural community. It's about five miles from a level three trauma center, but that trauma center has a helicopter base, and that helicopter carries whole blood, liquid plasma, and packed red cells, which is, which is a real scenario for a lot of our uh, system here in Colorado. Our Flight for Life helicopters carry all of that, and so do many of our bases. Um, it's three minutes by air and eight minutes by ground to that level three trauma center. The location is also 80 miles away from a good level two trauma center that, that has basically full capabilities. It's about a 27 minute flight and it's about 120 minutes by ground, uh, depending on, on the um, weather and circumstances. So that's where we are. The patient is a 38-year-old male. He's sitting in the driveway of uh, a, a friend's house. They're about to go on their first date. They ju he's just arrived, picked her up. They're sitting in the car. And the driver is shot with a handgun by the ex-boyfriend three times. And the female passenger is uninjured. She uses her cell phone to call the sheriff's office. And here's the report. So the victim sustained three gunshot wounds, one through and through the left axilla, one in the lower chest, one in the right thigh. The left axilla uh, has rapid blood loss. The passenger is holding pressure with a wadded up sweater and the patient is awake and complains of uh, abdominal, uh, left shoulder, and thigh pain. So at the scene, the caller reports that the shooter left the scene on foot and has current location unknown, so lost track of him. Two sheriff's deputies in a single vehicle show up. And about the same time, EMS paramedic unit arrives on scene. This is about 10 minutes after the initial injury. The caller yells over to the two vehicles and says that the victim is still losing a lot of blood. He's getting sleepy and more hard to wake up. So my first question, you've arrived on that scene. EMS and law enforcement are there and um, well, I can't see my questions to read them, but I'll, I'll let you read them. Um, so does EMS approach the scene uh, simultaneously with law enforcement? Does uh, law enforcement approach the victim first? Does, uh, and then does law enforcement okay uh, EMS to show up or does, does EMS make their own damn decision? about whether to, to go as long as, as law enforcement isn't fired on or 
do you call SWAT for an unsecured scene and wait for the troops to arrive? So that's the first poll question. Let's see what people say. Now, I'm kind of old, and I was actually the trauma medical director at one of the level one trauma centers that received the patients from Columbine. And the after action on Columbine reassessed the law enforcement protocols for that because law enforcement had an active shooter in the school. Their guideline was to not go in with the active shooter, but to wait for the scene to be secured by SWAT. And there were some additional folks shot. Uh, there was a school teacher who bled to death and they uh, reassessed their, their protocols. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll close the poll and it, um, it looks like 82% say law enforcement goes in first and then clears the way with uh, EMS. Now, not everybody's wearing body armor these days. Uh, what do you guys think? Flight nurses, EMS, body armor, this day and age? I think it's a nice, I think it's a nice thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think, think it's, it's also a, a little bit of a, it, uh, I, I think, think of body armor is similar to the way that I think of uh, those uh, support belts that people use at Sam's Club to keep their back in shape. It gives us a false sense of security. Um, so uh, I, I think it, it's toss up. Anybody, anybody want to, uh, EMS to go rushing in along with law enforcement in those settings? No, I got it. Make sure this is uh, safe. Yeah. All right. Let's let's go on. Okay. We need to take down the poll so I can get to the next slide. Okay, I'm not, I'm not able to change the slides still, it looks like. Okay. So, EMS arrives at the scene, patient's lethargic but arousable, able to say a few words, patient cyanotic and cool, there's about a liter of blood on the seat and active bleeding from the left axilla. The left chest has decreased breath sounds. There's no bleeding from the left chest. The abdomen, and this is in the lower left chest, the abdomen is slightly distended and tender. The thigh wound's only tangential. There's not a lot of bleeding. There's no pulse in the left arm. The carotid pulses are palpable. The right radial pulse is thready but palpable. And again, no pulse in the left arm, which is the shot arm. Blood pressure is 80 over 60, heart rate 130, respirators are 30, 89% sat on four liters, GCS is 14, and temperature is 37 degrees. So next question is, what would you do next? So A, would you do a blood sweep, direct pressure to the left axilla, and then pressure dressing or junctional tourniquet, extricate from the vehicle and scoop and run? Or B, would you do a scene RSI, follow the ABCs, uh, listen to breath sounds, needle the left chest if breath sounds absent, and apply the junctional tourniquet. Or C, apply mask O2, take a cuff pressure, start two large bore IVs, hang two liters of normal saline. D, place a junctional tourniquet, extricate and go, lines and needle the chest en route. So we'll see what everybody answers to that.
Um, what, what does everybody think in the room? D. D. Okay, and that's the uh, that's the majority answer. Although it's fairly close between A and D. Yeah. Well, so that, so so that's well that that's a great point because you know we say A B C right, and the blood sweep would be circulation. But the military's revised their guidelines. So now they've put hemorrhage control ahead of airway, or at least on par with it. So if you're in the field and you're all shot up, particularly if you're in a hostile environment, they're gonna do a very rapid blood sweep. They're gonna do what they term hasty tourniquets, put them over the clothing, just based on blood saturating the clothing. And so that's their blood sweep and hasty tourniquet as their first step. So I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Would you would you innovate this guy? Follow the ABCs? Would uh, you? I think B and, B and C are fairly not appropriate, but A and D, you make arguments you both. Yeah. Good point. You guys have any comments about that? I like it. It's not like me, I wouldn't innovate either just because they have a good country airway with their GCS right now. I think at 14, don't take away something you don't need to me. And anything you can do, on scene, you can do in the back of a safer head. Okay, so the point was anything you can do on scene, you can do in the back of the rig. And Again, we talked earlier about resuscitation. With truncal hemorrhage, what is your primary consideration? Speed the hemorrhage control. So here again, we, we showed this earlier. These are the two large military trials for time to death for truncal hemorrhage. This is mortality per, per hour. Those two studies have a remarkably consistent curve, and you're on a 35-minute countdown to dead with uncontrolled truncal hemorrhage. Here is the... Um, this is the original data from 2005 that was reanalyzed by Howard Champion again and by John Holcomb in, in 2016. And what they showed was that our survival in the trauma centers on that middle curve, that survival has uh, improved, but the percentage of deaths at the scene have actually gone up as the percentage of deaths at the hospitals have gone down. And that has to do with our ability to achieve hemorrhage control. And the fact that we are not uh, focusing on temporizing measures, hemorrhage control, TXAs, those kinds of things in the field, that's exactly what the TCCC was, was looking at. Um, comment, guys? ...to try to limit the amount of time that you're, you're messing with the patient to get into more extensive treatment. All right, so civilian mortality, we talked about this slide earlier today, and again, the time to hemorrhage control being the key. Now, this is an interesting study. It comes out of um, University of Miami. Uh, uh, Dr. Nemias and his group looked at this, and they've revised that golden hour to the golden 10 minutes. And what they, what they looked at was, where is the break point for survival in uncontrolled truncal hemorrhage in, in the hospital at the trauma center, where's the break point for survival for how quickly they get to the operating room? Now, we go, to the, we go direct to the operating room in, in our largest level one trauma center. We bypass the ED with those patients because we think it makes a difference. And here's a study out of Miami that shows that that break point is actually about 10 minutes. And if you look at those two slides, the, or, or the two lines, the red are patients that get to the OR for definitive hemorrhage control within, within zero to 10 minutes. And the second line is 11 to 60 minutes. So there's a break point even before the end of that golden hour. You commented, Kathy, on, on, on rapid sequence intubation. Scott, I think when you were talking earlier, you said it took you a while to do rapid sequence intubation. This is one of the few trials that has ever looked at whether you ought to do field intubation in uncontrolled truncal hemorrhage, or in this case, in severe TBI. 
And this, we know that our paramedics are really good at doing innovation in the field. They get it done 95, 98% of the time. They're really good at it. It's just like our trauma surgeons are really good at doing these big elegant operations, but should we? Should we be doing meatball damage control surgery? And the same question, should we be doing field intubation just because we can? And this study was done a while back, but it was 209 severe TBI patients. They did seen RSI with versus 627 matched controls. The mortality was higher in the group that got seen intubation. The good outcome was worse in that group. And when they and, and they terminated the study early because it was showing a divergence in outcome even before the end of the study. And when they looked at the factors, the factors were transient hypoxemia and hypotension, uh, inadvertent hyperventilation, which we know is bad for brain injury because it causes increased cerebral vasoconstriction. And then the prolonged scene time on average was six and a half minutes. I don't believe it. I think it takes longer than six and a half minutes to do a field RSI. What do you guys think? <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean you can't do it. The question is, is it the priority? You've got a patient who still has an open airway and is phonating. Shock is a relative indication for RSI, not an absolute. And you compare a patient who's on a 35 minute countdown to dead from uncontrolled truncal hemorrhage, are you gonna burn seven or 10 or more minutes of that 35 minutes doing a field RSI, or are you gonna manage the airway in the rig on the way to hemorrhage control? And, and I think that was, that was the point of the, uh, of the RSI paper. So EMS places tourniquet to the left, left axilla. Arterial hemorrhage is controlled, but has continued moderate venous ooze. Now remember this gunshot's right at the axilla. So they've got the junctional tourniquet on and it's uh, holding the arterial pressure, but you're still getting a lot of back bleeding from the arm at the site of the gunshot wound. The left chest wound has no active hemorrhage, but has decreased breath sounds. The left thigh doesn't have external hemorrhage or, or expanded hematoma. The vital signs, 80 over 60, 130, GCS is 14, no neurodeficits, no pulse in the arm. What do you think about the no pulse in the arm? Is that arm in trouble? Independent of bleeding to death, that arm's lost its blood supply. How long do you have for warm ischemic time on, a, uh, on an extremity that's lost blood supply? Most of us think around six hours. And so that's a priority, but certainly not a priority over hemorrhage control. So we talked about where we were. We were close by ground to a level three. We were 27 minutes by air to a level two. And so the next question is mode of transport and destination. So do you do ground to the level three, call a trauma team activation, have OR and anesthesia ready to go? Do you go by air? to the scene and then transport to the level two, 27 minutes away? Do you go by air to the scene and transport back by air to the level three, three minutes away? Or do you ground to level three helipad and rendezvous for air transport to level two? And I'll tell you, there's no clear right answer here. <laughs> weather is clear. The, 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 the initial scenario said weather was clear and roads were clear. And the helicopter has blood, correct? The helicopter has blood, correct. That complicates it, doesn't it? One of the reasons to call helicopters to the scene is additional resources, right? But is that where, I mean, part of the question here is where is the break point for ground versus air transport if you're going 27 minutes away or if you're going three minutes away? And if you're on the 35 minute countdown with truncal hemorrhage and a hypotensive patient, do you spend that added air time or do you get to a center that's got surgery available, but now it's a level three that has surgery available on a 30 minute call in, not necessarily, a, not necessarily an immediate. All right, so again, this, this was pretty close. Um, all three answers were within 10 percentage points of each other. 
So clearly there's not one right answer. What do you guys think about this? I would think ground level three. Uh, you have all our availability there. Uh, it's it's going to be the quickest way to get this patient to the operating room. Yeah. I think you could make a case for D, ground to the level three helipad, and then a quick transfer to air for the rest of the trip. If the helicopter is supplied with blood, as we know, and that crew has the skill to put a chest tube in if needed, I think that's a viable option as well. This is one of yours with no clear right answer, I think. The one that doesn't make sense to me is to call air to the scene back to the level three. So what, what would you tell your EMS agencies? <laughs> so, so in working with the EMS agencies, I would tend to go with, with D as well. Um, now that depends if I've got a, a surgeon and I've got an OR staff that's waiting for me at the door. When I get to the level three, that may change. If I know that there's a 30 minute call in, uh, for me, it's quicker to drive the six minutes to a helicopter that's ready to go because they're going to have some time where we have to call, we have to, to activate them. They need to get the aircraft and, and do weather checks. So for me, that really would be the, the best option in situations I've had. Dr. Harris, what do you think? I actually would make a case for B as well um, because working working in similar level hospitals and having been in several of them i mean this patient needs a vascular surgeon right and so a lot of times at your level three trauma center you're going to have a general surgeon which can probably temporize and manage this wound a little bit but if we're talking about a six hour time to ischemia and this patient goes to a level three trauma center gets a little bit of a temporizing measure you may still have arm ischemia. It may take another couple of hours to then get that patient to a definitive surgeon. So I think there's actually a good case for B as well and getting somewhere where you may have that vascular surgeon on standby right away. Right under that 30 minute range. The, the yeah. break point for air versus ground transfer, right? Yeah. But with D, if you notify them as you're on scene, they can start spooling up and be ready for you when you get there. Yeah. So I think this is a very good discussion. It's one that happens quite frequently. And this speaks. Try to make the best decision. And even in that circumstance, the best decision is not always clear. And, and I, think this, I think this is reflective of the answers. You could make the case for almost any of these. And, and they were with, like I said, within 10 percentage points of each other in the answers. And, and you hear a, a difference of opinion among our experts who are guys that lead agencies and do this all the time, okay? All right, so question four, pre-hospital TXA. No, yes, one gram followed by drip. Yes, one gram, no drip. D, yes, two grams. Let's see what everybody thinks. <laughs> <laughs> you get extra credit if the patient lives. <laughs> I do have a quick question with the two gram though. Uh huh. Well, so so the original crash two trial was one gram immediately followed by a one gram drip over eight hours. What most what a lot of the trauma centers now are doing is giving two grams all at once. Now, in the previous section, there was a there was a question about TXA causing seizures. And there's also a question about TXA causing rebound thrombosis in vascular injury. And so, so there are some things about TXA that would cause you to question this. Now the seizure problem with TXA in my mind is relatively minor. It, it, um, it, it, it has to do with the, with the glycine receptors and it can increase excitability in neural tissues. If you've got fibrinolytic shutdown and you give TXA to a vascular injured patient, you may increase the risk of rebound thrombosis and subsequent uh, clotting. But when you compare that to bleeding to death, I don't think anybody ought to be worried about giving TXA for fear of either seizures or clotting when you don't have 
uh, when you don't have all the information in front of you. So that's, that's my opinion about seizures and clotting in TXA. I was just gonna say, I think, I think her question is specifically though is, do I just push the whole vial in or do I put the push and just let it go over Yeah, I think that's sort of like, I can't answer because that's really interesting. <laughs> so one of the things that we've done with, with some of our agencies, and, and I very consciously use a descriptor. So we're not really doing a drip, we're using a bolus infusion. Okay. So we'll put the two grams in a 50 or 100 cc bag and just open it up. That way I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry, is it slow push? You know, slow push for a paramedic is this. Yeah. Fast push, I can't get that fast. So, so that's something to think about when you're doing that. And it's been effective for us to do a, a bolus infusion and not really call it a drip. Okay, no, that's perfect, thank you. I, I mean, it'll be dependent on protocol too, but I was just curious on how you guys did it. What, what are you doing in the air? Same thing. Same thing? Yeah, wide open, getting okay. in quickly. If you, Bill, if you get a patient coming into your center and they've gotten the first gram in the rig. And, and they're, they're starting the drip. drip. Do you continue the drip or do you give the second gram? I would probably just give the second gram. Yeah. I think that's what we're, where most of us are following fall these days. days. Okay. So we, we see the answers there. The majority answer was, yes, go ahead and give the two grams. That's the TCCC protocol now, but it is not the civilian protocol for TXA yet. But I kind of agree with that. How do I get this off of here? Okay, okay so pre-hospital TXA. So, so this is the correct trial. This is the actual data. 270 hospitals. Uh, 40 countries, uh, 20,000 patients, very high safety profile, uh, survival advantage in the first hour, most pronounced with TXA up to three hours. Beyond three hours, there was a survival disadvantage. A lot of weaknesses in the study, wasn't well designed. Um, but at any rate, that's what evidence is out there. That's what we're following. And there's some, there's some additional studies to support that. The, the uh, military application of TXA, there are a number of other studies that are also out there that are supportive. All right, next question. You've got the guy in the rig. You're, start, you've, you've, you're putting lines. We talked about what we were going to do in the rig. You're going to resuscitate. Where do you target the systolic blood pressure in this patient? So anywhere from 140 to 60, let's see what everybody says. Okay. So we have a winner, C, blood pressure 85 systolic. Comment from our panel. <laughs> I think you can make an argument for either B or C. A is too high, D is too low. 85 seems appropriate. 110 may be appropriate in this patient, but it's a younger patient, so I think 85 is probably appropriate. I agree. Yeah. You know, I would say if, if you've got a 90, 110 might very well be the, the blood pressure target for permissive hypotension. If you look at the pre-hospital destination guidelines from the American College of Surgeons and the CDC, that original guideline from 2011 that talked about uh, who goes to a trauma center, and we all know that it's it's uh, physiology, anatomy, mechanism, special circumstances. In the special circumstances of that algorithm, they comment that 110 may be shock in a greater than 65 year old. So I think the point about age related permissive hypotension is uh, is an important point. But it also makes me completely crazy when I see patients that have uncontrolled hemorrhage, no head injury, and they come into a hospital and they've got, they've got a blood pressure of 105, and somebody gives them two liters of saline and blows their blood pressure up to 140, what does that do for the triad of death? What does that do for, for popping the clot? What does that do for making them cold and acidotic and dilutional? And so that's, uh, that's something that I would not recommend doing anymore. So I like the C answer. 
Okay. So permissive hypotension, we talked about that earlier today. Clear survival advantage, crystalloid was the problem. It's the crystalloid stupid, right? Remember that? So anyway, so transport. So this patient gets loaded, junctional tourniquet, MASCO2, 94% set, IV, LR, attempting to target blood pressure of 85, gets a gram of TXA, uh, blood pressures. Uh, 60, heart rate's 150, left chest gets vented with a rush of air and some blood, blood pressure improves temporarily, then drops again to 60, abdomen's more distended and tender, patient arrives at the level three trauma center as a trauma team activation, they, they get in the rig on the way to the level three, the OR is going to be available in 20 minutes. So, are we in trouble? Yeah. Trouble in the air also? Okay. <laughs> clearly not good answers to this. If it were easy, anybody do it, right? So the patient arrives at the level three, blood pressure 60 over 40, heart rate's 170. Remember, this is a 38 year old guy. He's on a non rebreather, still able to phonate. GCS is 14, no lateralizing signs. Uh, venous oozing from the axillary wound with a moderate sized hematoma, left wrist with no pulses, hand is cool. There's one 18 gauge IV that was placed in root, two liters of LR is already in. You still got a blood pressure of 60. Blood pressure is decreased in the left chest with an entrance just above the costal margin. The exit is right posterior lateral uh, abdomen and the abdomen is distended and tender. All right, everybody got it? Where, where is injuries? Chest, and chest through the diaphragm, abdomen, plus major hemorrhage in the axilla. And the thigh, no big deal, right? Okay. So, level three ED course, second line, massive transfusion with whole blood, then one to one after whole blood's used. Uh, no platelets available. One of the drawbacks of a level three trauma center. And um, left chest tubes placed, rush of air, 200 cc's of blood. The uh, FAST is positive for peritoneal blood. Pericardium does not have fluid. Blood pressure is still 60, heart rate 150 after a unit of whole blood, one of pack cells and one of plasma. ORs getting ready. They're gonna be ready in 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, Anesthesia is on a 30 minute call in, whereas the surgeons are generally on a 20 minute call in. So you're still waiting for the anesthesiologist to arrive. And it's more important for the OR to be ready than have the anesthesiologist there because the, it takes them longer to get ready. So it's going to be all ready about the same time. So question six, you've got a chest tube placed. They go ahead and do the RSI now because you've got plenty of troops. So shock is a relative indication for intubation, entirely appropriate to go ahead. So they go ahead and intubate. So now what's your next step? Do you go to the CT scan for chest, abdomen, and pelvis without contrast because of the concern of acute kidney injury? Do you do a zone three Reboa? Uh, continue whole blood MTP? Uh, add a more distal tourniquet to the left arm to slow the venous return and go to the OR for a laparotomy? C, do you do a zone one Reboa? Whole blood MTP, add a 30 cc Foley balloon instead of the tourniquet, and then go to the OR for laparotomy? Or D, do you do a resuscitative thoracotomy instead of the zone one Reboa for persistent hypotension below 70? And uh, then MTP, axillary Foley tamponade, and OR for laparotomy. So those are your choices. If it were easy, anybody do it? What do you guys think? <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to go to CT. The patient's stable, that positive fast. I mean, um, I wouldn't do an ED thoracotomy. It was the only one you got 30 minutes in, right? And then probably tamponade with the filler balloons. Like I said, this was easy. Anybody do it, right? So, what do you guys think? What would you do in the ED without your surgeon? <laughs> I haven't been trained on Rebola, so um, I'm a little limited with that too, actually. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think from my perspective, I think I, I like this guy. E's choice is sometimes is, is the best that I can do. And I think, yeah, continuing that MTP. 
I like the idea of putting the Foley catheter in so that we can try and gain a little bit of better control from we know we can see the axillary bleeding. Um, I can't necessarily see where the bleeding's coming from in the belly right now, but I think you're just going to kind of have to continue your resuscitation the best you can until you can get a surgeon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Lechuga, are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. You want to put them in the helicopter, Kathy? Uh, not prior to the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So the majority of the answers were, were C, but again, it was a fairly close call, 58% versus 23% for D and 17% for B. Uh, not very many people wanted to go to CAT scan. I agree with that. Death begins in CAT scan. All right. So one thing, Dr. Main, so Kathy brought this up, if we were going to go in a helicopter, I know that there are some systems that will place a Reboa, but they don't inflate it. Yep. So that might also be an option here where they place it for the helicopter crew if they look like there's going to be delay from the, the OR yep. and fly them and then inflate if necessary. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good point. You, you know, your time frame here is 27 minute flight time. That's the outer margin of time for zone one Reboa. And you've got a situation here where the ro zone one Reboa should go ahead and be deployed. You're already in trouble. You're on the verge of arresting. But the same is true for resuscitated thoracotomy. The indication for resuscitated thoracotomy, one of them has always been persistent blood pressure of less than 70 despite aggressive resuscitation. That's one of those forgotten indications for resuscitative thoracotomy. And it's also a, resusc a, 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 a indication for zone one Reboa placement to get you, to buy you time to get the abdomen open. And, and I, think, I think this is a good use of zone one Reboa in a level three trauma center where you're waiting, you know, another 10 minutes for the OR to be ready to go. That's enough to temporize and buy you some time. And it lets you do it without having to do a resuscitative thoracotomy. So I think this is one of those indications where you might very well want to do that. Comments, guys? Yeah, I agree. I'd rather put a Reboa in than a thoracotomy. <laughs> Your outcomes from your thoracotomy are going to be miserably low compared to doing a Reboa. So I think if you're you're headed down the, the thoracotomy route, you're really not going to have much chance at all in saving this patient. Okay. Right. Are with a uh, now this is a Reboa. This is a Zone Three Reboa, and it was one I showed before. Zone One above the xiphoid for the abdominal. Zone Zone. One Reboa is not indicated for major chest injury, although there's a paper out of, a couple of papers out of Cali, Columbia, which is uh, uh, where they have a ton of penetrating trauma experience. And they're using zone one Reboa in the chest in certain injuries. They're using it in the vena cava. Um, Maryland Shock Trauma sends their fellows on a rotation, their trauma fellows on a rotation to Cali, Columbia, because that hospital is so busy. They're doing penetrating trauma all day, all night, every day. And they send them down there. They put them in the operating room and they operate till they're exhausted. Then they go get a little sleep and then they come back and walk in the operating room. And that's what they're doing the whole time. And they're coming out with some papers that suggest additional indications for Reboa, but uh, not quite there yet. So whole blood versus component therapy, we're talking about that. We talked about that before. You know, when you look at whole blood, um, the hemoglobin is 12 to 13 as opposed to nine for component therapy. Um, hematocrit's higher, platelets are higher. Um, very little, um, very little complication with its use. There are a whole bunch of papers, safety profile for low titer group O, O positive whole blood, and uh, that's that's becoming the the standard now. This is a paper out of 2020. Uh, so level three course. So zone one Reboa blood pressure improves to 100. Uh, get to the OR. Laparotomy shows a left diaphragm injury. Grade four spleen with active bleeding. Pancreatic tail injury. Um, small bowel laceration times two with brisk mesenteric bleeding and a right colon injury, okay? So, so sort of a surgeon's nightmare. And uh, we're one unit of whole blood, three of packed cells, two of liquid plasma, one of FFP, blood pressure is 90, heart rate's 120. 
Uh, O2 sets 97% on an FiO2 of 0.80. Um, we're on, we're going to say a word or two about ventilator management here because tidal volume in this case is uh, 460 cc's and we're on a PEEP of five. Do you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, we talked about uh, deploying the uh, remote but not quite inflating it. Mm -hmm. What about, so for instance, we're 45 minutes from every uh, trauma center right here. No uh, if we, what would be the, since we're not at that 30 minute time zone, would it be uh, feasible or even bias any kind if we uh, lowered that cup just for a little bit and then let it reproduce for a bit and then? That, that, is, that is a great question that wasn't escaped on, on the Reboa company. They're coming out now with a new catheter that you can modulate the pressure in the balloon and do partial flow and, and do things to try to extend that time. And uh, so right now, you're, the studies on zone one Reboa with full occlusion show somewhere between 30 to 60 minutes dead and can't, can't return flow. Uh, but they're looking at exactly that. The data's not out there. Um, zone three Reboa, now nah, you may have two or three hours in zone three. So if you've got a pelvic injury, that's a different story. But there's no, there's no clear right answer, but this is one of the reasons that rural trauma mortality is higher than urban. And it's not for lack of capability. It's not for smart guys being able to act. It's just lack of resource. And so that's a great question that's being worked on right now. I expect that catheter to come out in the next six, six months or so. Where do you put the ventilator settings on somebody who is in shock at risk for ARDS? So you want, so you want their... If, if they're, they're super, super high risk, risk for ARDS, you don't want to overinflate their lungs, right? So usually we try and keep their settings a little bit on the lower side as far as tidal volumes, because the more barrow trauma you give them or the real high peep, real high volumes, you're going to end up bursting all those alveoli that are already super high risk for ARDS. So usually on the lower side of ventilator management, you may need to increase their rate a little bit so that you're getting appropriate oxygenation, but definitely want to stay on the lower side. So generally, we're trying to set the ventilator four to six cc's per kilo tidal volume so that you don't overinflate. Now, if you're treating already existing ARDS, you're going to use high peep, but not if you're doing preemptive ARDSnet standard ventilation. So you wouldn't necessarily use high peep, and you particularly would not use high peep in somebody who is already in hypovolemic shock because that increased chest pressure is going to impede venous return through the chest and, and further make the heart think it's seeing hypovolemia. So I, I think 460 cc's and five a peep, absolutely appropriate in this setting. Okay, you're in the operating room. You got that constellation of injury. So let's, let's take a look back at that for a minute. Um, so diaphragm injury, grade four spleen with active bleeding, pancreas injury, small bowel, and colon. Okay, what procedures are you gonna do? Pack the spleen and pancreas, ligate the mesenteric bleeding, oversew the small bowel and colon injuries, close the abdomen to help tamponade the bleeding, deflate the reboa at the end of the procedure and go to the ICU for stabilization. B, Splenectomy, ligate the mesenteric bleeding, deflate the balloon as the Reboa ASAP, distal pancreatectomy, small bowel and colon resection, leave them in discontinuity, don't try to sew them back together, close the diaphragm, quick clot packs, and leave the abdomen open with an open abdomen dressing, and then air transport from the OR to your regional trauma center. And question seven, is the same as B, except you go back to the ICU at the level three facility, and D is the same as B, except transport to CT scan to make sure there are no additional injuries. All right, so let's see what people think.
Okay, let's go ahead and, and close that off. So uh, the, the majority answer was B, uh, do the damage control laparotomy, uh, do what you got to do to stop the bleeding, stop the contamination control, and get them out of the operating room in the air. You, you could make the argument for that, absolutely. But again, you still have the axillary bleeding that hasn't been addressed. You, you've got a Foley balloon and a tourniquet. Uh, you, you've got a relatively unstable axillary artery that's temporarily controlled, but may not stay that way. And now you've got, you're getting them out of shock. You're raising that blood pressure up and have the potential to pop the clot and cause more bleeding in the axilla. So I, I think that's why I would have chosen to, to go instead of spending a little more time. Although our mantra is to try to restore survivable physiology. And if you are unstable, the last place you want to be is in the air. What, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Um, still have to deal with that axillary injury. And so you don't want to waste time trying to resuscitate this patient when you want to get them. You do what you can to take care of the abdominal injuries and the bleeding, and you don't want to close the abdomen, you want to leave it open. So they're probably going to go back in and, and reassess what's going on. Um, but you want to try to get him to somebody that just has a vascular surgeon to get that repaired because you're, you only have so much time for that ischemic arm. Were it not for the, the arterial injury, I, I might have considered doing just what you said. Uh, and, and if the patient had not stabilized to a large extent, I might have considered stabilizing before going. Because, you know, helicopter is not a great place to try to resuscitate at somebody either. So that's a good point. Okay. Don't seem to be working now. Let's see. Okay, so it's key elements to damage control resuscitation. We talked about that in the earlier talk. Uh, temporizing measures, permissive hypotension, limited crystalloid, start blood early, damage control surgery, reverse the lethal triad. And damage control surgery, leave in discontinuity, achieve primary contamination control, hemorrhage control, leave the abdomen open, and get them out of there. Okay. So the advanced resuscitative care, once again, uh, temporizing measures, pre-hospital Reboa, pre-hospital plasma, blood, TXA, whole blood resuscitation when you can, and time to definitive hemorrhage control. So the post-operative course. So the decision was not to address the axillary vascular injury at the level three center. So the tourniquet and Foley were left in place with bleeding relatively controlled. Patients four hours out from the initial injury, remember on the six hour countdown to potential loss of extremity from decreased blood supply. Reboa is left in, as Kathy said, not inflated in case they crash en route and, and then have the ability to inflate uh, if they sustain more abdominal hemorrhage and crash en route. Um, the uh, post-op chest x-ray shows the ET tube and chest tubes in place. So it's not a left main stem intubation. Uh, end tidal CO2 is okay. You don't have a pneumo or hemothorax. At departure, here are your vital signs. End tidal CO2 is okay. Uh, lactate's elevated, INR is elevated, blood's running at a slow rate to keep blood pressure around the 100 systolic. Uh, you're flying to the other center. You get 12 minutes from landing. And now blood pressure drops to 60, heart rate increases to 140, SATs 88. You've got no external bleeding seen. Breast sounds are still equal. The chest tube does not have air leak or bleeding. So you're in the rig, you're 12 minutes out, and now you crash in what seems to be hypovolemic shock again. Next steps, start dopamine. Increase whole blood administration to a target blood pressure of 90. Inflate the Reboa. 
And remember, it only takes three to five cc's generally to inflate a Reboa, and you inflate it to modulate the blood pressure you're trying to achieve. Or do you do uh, B and C? And by the way, your O2 sat's only 88%, so you're gonna increase your FiO2 to one, as opposed to 70, which you were previously on, but not change the PEEP or, or tidal volume. All right, so what, what would you do here? Okay, let's go ahead and stop that. Uh, answer was, uh, the majority answer was D, that is to increase your whole blood administration, inflate the Reboa, and increase your oxygen delivery. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> inflate that Reboa. Yeah. Now, one of the questions that always comes up, if you're out of whole, whole blood, blood, what's your, your next resuscitation fluid? That answer often is plasma. plasma. So, um, because if you've been using whole blood, it's unlikely you're gonna have um, a low hematocrit. It's also unlikely you're gonna have a coagulopathy. And so the next question is, do you wanna, do you wanna give pack cells or plasma? Well, the answer is technically you wanna give both in the one-to-one -one ratio, but you can't necessarily give them both at the same time. So which do you give first? And a lot of times that answer is plasma. What, uh, what, what do you guys think? Yeah. yeah I think they need the volume, so they don't necessarily need the red cells. Okay. The hypovolemic shock continuum. I talked earlier today about why vasopressors are contraindicated in hypovolemic shock. You're increasing systemic vascular resistance, pap, uh, pumping against the higher pressure, and you're making the blood pressure look better at the extent at the expense of overall cardiac output. I have that discussion with our anesthesiologists all the time. Knee-jerk reactions start vasopressors in somebody who's going into shock, even if it's hypovolemic. Uh, I, I, tell our, I tell our folks that, you know, you're making the blood pressure look better uh, at the expense of cardiac output. It makes you feel better because you've done something to fix the blood pressure, but you've hurt the overall cardiac output. My comment was, look, you want to feel better? Go get a shrink, but quit doing that to our trauma patients. So we talked about the compensated shock physiology earlier. So this patient arrives at the level two, goes direct to the OR. O OR, the uh, Reboa was inflated, whole blood increased. Uh, on arrival, you got a heart rate of 130, blood pressure of 170, lactate's three and a half, end tidal CO2 is pretty good, saturation's pretty good. Thromboelastography suggests the need for both platelets cry and cryo. There's no hyperfibrinolysis, so the TXA has been effective in this case. Uh, MTPs continued with a six pack of platelets in cryo based on the PEG. Everybody good with that so far? Okay, next step, reopen the abdomen, secure abdominal hemorrhage, deflate the Reboa and place an open abdomen dressing. Uh, B is to do A first and then direct axillary ex exploration. C, Place a second femoral sheath, deflate the Reboa, thread the balloon up into the axillary artery on the affected side and blow that, that uh, catheter up to get proximal control with balloon inflation in the subclavian artery. And then deflate the junctional tourniquet and explore the axilla. Or D, do a combination of A and C. So what do you think? If it was easy, anybody do it, right? <laughs> Fewer people are answering this when I get that. <laughs> okay, let's let's shut that off. So 67% are saying A and C. So 
so one of the one of the principles of vascular injury is getting proximal and distal control on the vessel and you've got uncontrolled hemorrhage in an area that's really hard to get proximal control proximal control uh is is up in the chest basically so your choices are to dive into that axilla and maybe lose control of the hemorrhage maybe lose control forever because that junctional tourniquet is very tenuous so do you risk diving into it the other way to get proximal control is to zip the sternum do a flat door across and get control of the subclavian artery with a big chest operation the other is to use a uh, interventional radiology uh, balloon occlusion catheter and thread it into that axilla up through the opposite femoral artery and and get control with that and so that's that's what was done here that's the better strategy now the problem is if you're in a level three trauma center and you don't have a hybrid room and all of the endovascular equipment that's part of the problem with a rural trauma center where you've got this kind of injury now you got to decide what to do and unless you're an old school guy who's been th doing this forever and and trained in an era where everybody did everything the, the problem with that is our newer trauma surgeons are relying on vascular surgery to do some of these things and if if you don't have that capability in a rural trauma center then that patient's going to be in real trouble and there is no good solution to this. So this highlights the differences between a higher level trauma center that Dr. Lechuga was talking about earlier today and why you, why you have to do some things differently. Comment, guys? Yeah, I agree. That's, that's the right answer. I don't want to go directly higher than the axolotl. Uh, it's better to get any other to get balloon yeah. occlusion. That, that axillary artery will retract back into the chest. Now you've got complete loss of control in a blood mass. Okay. All right, so OR course, uh, additional oozings repacked and controlled, pegs improved, uh, axillary explored after the balloon catheter occlusion. Uh, median nerves intact, uh, thrombus, re so uh, the, the, foley, the, foger, the foley's removed. There's a little bit of thrombus that happened in the artery because of the prolonged compression, and it, it began to clot because we weren't anticoagulated with the artery clotted, so there's always some risk of that. But you use a, a thrombectomy catheter. You use local infusion of heparin to try to, to uh, prevent any more clot formation. And then next step, what are you going to do? Are you going to do an artery interposition graft and ligate the vein and do a fasciotomy? Artery vein and temporary shunt? Are you going to do just C, a fasciotomy, or, or answer D, B, and C? That's almost not their question. That's, that's a level one trauma center kind of question. But I didn't, want to, I didn't want to do this without completing what happened with the case. And of course, the answer, we'll, we'll go ahead. 71%, you guys are good. You're saying doing uh, uh, answer D, doing both B and C. And of course, I can't. There we go. All right, so, there's, so this is the case that I showed you earlier. So what, what you're seeing here is the median nerve being retracted out of the way. You're seeing the artery and vein right at the axilla. You see that the balloon up here at the artery occluded the artery, but you still had venous backflow from the vein. That's why you continued to have bleeding. And so the answer to that is to go ahead and shunt both the artery and vein. You're five or six hours into a six hour countdown to a dead extremity. You're gonna get a compartment syndrome for sure, and you're gonna get a serious reperfusion injury. And, and so you, you want to minimize the time to reperfusion. And, and that's why that's the value of a temporary artery and vein shunt in that setting. And again, you see the effectiveness of that Foley balloon being blown up and controlling that hemorrhage. So there's, there's another picture of it. Um, there's the interposition graph that was done later. There's another picture of the Foley balloon. 
Here's uh, Dave Feliciano's paper from more than 10 years ago. He was, he's a vascular and trauma surgeon. He was uh, chief of trauma at Grady Memorial in Atlanta, affiliated with Emory, one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. He's also a military guy. And he brought the vascular shunt uh, experience from the military to the civilian world, published a paper on 10 years of experience with that. There have been uh, many additional papers since then talking about the value of doing temporary vascular shunts, shunts so that you uh, mitigate reperfusion injury, uh, reduce the incidence of compartment syndrome. So temporary vascular shunt indication when you're pushing the time limit. Uh, when you've got more than one operation that you need to do, tibial plateau fractures are notorious for this. And, uh, and those shunts can remain in for 24 to 36 hours, even without heparin and maintain flow. So it's a good thing to do. So uh, at the trauma center, ICU for resuscitation, A-line, central line in place, uh, MTP infusion rate modulated to the resuscitation endpoints and terminated when termination endpoints were met. Uh, further dis decisions about vascular repair, open abdomen management. Uh, finally, what's your end point of resuscitation in a patient now that has gone through all of this? You get them back to the ICU. Are you going to manage them to blood pressure, pulse, urine output? Are you going to manage them to serial CVP, serial lactates? Are you going to do A-line based uh, volume responsiveness assessments? Uh, we're putting flow tracks in people and do uh, pulse variation on the A-line. There's a way to do this with uh, a, finger, um, a finger pulse oximeter type uh, measurement that, that tells you volume responsiveness. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's suggested is doing bedside ultrasound to look at vena cava volume variation and right ventricular uh, volume variation. Uh, what are you going to use for endpoints and resuscitation in this kind of complicated patient? So that's, that's the poll. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the, the point is that there were studies from back in the early 90s that showed we talked about compensated shock and falling off the cliff going into overt shock and then how you have to resuscitate people back not only through overt shock but through compensated shock and those older studies showed that once once you resuscitate somebody back to normal blood pressure pulse and urine output 80% of those patients are still in compensated shock by continuing to generate a lactate load. And we look at lactate production versus lactate metabolism, and you really need to, re you need to correct not only the, the overt shock, but the compensated shock so that you don't magnify the systemic inflammatory response that results from incomplete resuscitation, part of that um, late phase death that RM Scali talks to, talks, uh, speaks to in the um, golden hour. So day one, femoral sheaths come out, interposition grafts using the saphenous vein. Next day, abdominal washout, small bowel reanastomosis, uh, colostomy with a long uh, Hartman segment. You don't try to sew that colon back together in somebody who's been in profound shock. And um, put some drains in the pancreatic bed. You've, you've resected the pancreas. Uh, day five, plastic surgery does a closure over the uh, axilla. Uh, pay, get, patient gets out of the ICU and day 12 goes home. So pretty good outcome from that. Uh, complicated case. It's a good example of closely coordinated uh, systems of care, trying to do the right thing at each point and points out the difficulty of making the right decision at the right time because it's never clear cut. So I want to thank our panel. Thanks everybody for being here. We are done.